ready. Recognize the city of champs. Boston, baby, we do what you can't. Locked on number 18, Tatum and Brown, J team. Step back, we gon' wet that and slay teams. Of course, the Celtics, who else could it be? Screaming like KG with the Larry OB. Corral is above average, assessing the team status. Best daily pod, no cap, salary matching. Clutch like Bird to DJ, keep John on replay. Prime time, dapping up the truth on the sideline. Rain and Jays, how it started, raising banners, how we finish. Locked on Celtics, pod, home of the winners. B. Hey there, welcome back to the Locked On Celtics podcast. Thank you so much for making this show part of your regular routine. I am here for you three days a week now in August and September. The Celtics are very close to returning. There's a preseason game in two months, two months away from a preseason game. So we're going to be back to a a five-day-a-week schedule pretty quickly here. But for now... Three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, unless circumstances uh, warrant a change in the schedule, in which case, very glad to make a change in the schedule. This show is free, fresh for you, wherever you get your podcasts, you can watch the show on YouTube. I'm John Corrales. I cover the Celtics for Boston Sports Journal. It's my 16th season covering this franchise, so I'm catching up to the number of banners. So, I mean, if you want to keep adding banners to the list, I'll keep adding years to covering this team. So thank you so much for subscribing and sharing and all of that stuff. Today, it is a mailbag podcast. Mailbag podcast. I ask you to send in your questions via johncorrales.com slash mailbag. Or if you just go to johncorrales.com, you can see the mailbag link at the top there. Uh, submit your questions that way. It's honestly, I know people suggest the YouTube comments. People want to DM me on Twitter. People want to send me. D- I cannot, honestly, I'm sorry. I cannot keep up with the DMs from all over the place. So that is the only place where I will accept questions and, uh, johncorrales.com slash mailbag today show brought to you by bet online bet online has you covered this season with more props odds and lines than ever before bet online is where the game starts we're going to start the mailbag with a bunch of jalen brown stuff a block first block all about jalen brown then we get into some backup big stuff because that's the next big topic and then later on some more fun stuff people want to ask me about 90s basketball and the question about college versus the pros this always happens the great college teams versus the, the worst nba teams that's coming up later 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 so stick around for that joe asks what are your thoughts on jalen brown's impending free agency given the security money and major role on a championship contender why would jb ever leave and i'm going to roll in christian's question as well Jalen Brown is not likely to sign an extension as he will make more on the open market. Is there any time towards the end of Jalen Brown's contract where the Celtics could offer more than just the extension? So this is all part of the same kind of thing. Jalen Brown is going to become a free agent. That is absolutely going to happen. He is, unless there is some ridiculous change of heart or whatever, it's almost impossible to comprehend him not becoming a free agent because if he signs an extension, the Celtics can offer an extension. If he signs it, he'll be giving up. I don't know what the exact math is going to be because the the cap is going to change, but it's tens of millions of dollars. And why do that? Why, why not maximize your value and go, you know, get your money, get the money that you've earned. Get that 30% of the cap or 35% of the cap. If he makes an all-NBA team, he'll get the Supermax. So he's going to see over the next two years if he can make an all-NBA team. And if he does, he's going to get more money. Why sign an extension now? Why cost yourself that? And and the, the reaction there might be, well, because the extension is plenty of money and you don't need more money than that. To which I say, I mean, anybody that wants to give up 40, 50, 60 million dollars and say, nah, I got enough. I don't need an extra 50, 60 million dollars. Then good luck to you. 
I'm uh, congratulations on being a better person than I would be. Cause I'm saying if I have the opportunity to, to get 60 more million dollars, I think I'm going to get that. I'm going to take that because it's $60 million or $50 million or 40 million, whatever the number is after you make your, if you do make an all NBA team and whatever the percentage of the cap is at that time. So it's, it's a significant amount of money. And I will remind everybody that most of these guys have until, well, much less than Jalen Brown, but these star players, Jalen Brown is a star player. Those guys have until you're 36, 37, 38 to make all of the money they're going to make for the most part in their entire lives, right? It's not like you or me where, hey, I just sit here and type and talk. I can do this until I keel over at my at my keyboard. I'll just keep doing it uh, until people stop listening or stop reading. So that's I have that luxury. Jalen and NBA players in general have to make all of their money in a very short amount of time. Ten years, most guys it's less. Some guys it's 15. Some guys are lucky enough for it to be more than that. And yeah, you can make your money off of endorsements and and maybe you get a TV gig or something else. But, you know, chances are, especially these guys now, it's not like Charles Barkley, who is making $10 million a year at TNT, which is more than he ever made in the NBA based on, you know, when he came, came up, how he came up. Uh, That era, the most he's ever made was like nine in the NBA which was a lot at the time. But these guys, if you have the potential to make $40 million a year over rather than 30, you, you have to do it. Can the Celtics offer him anything before his contract is over? That's not just that same extension. No, Nope. I wonder how that rule is going to be. Like, is that rule going to be changed? Is it going to be looked at if a player wants to sign a max contract to stay? If the Celtics, and Jalen Brown are both cool with a five-year contract at 30% of the cap, which is the current max and 8% raises, then if they're cool with that, they're cool with that. Sign it now. Just, Just lock it in. Make that the extension. But because the rules for extending a player are based off of a raise, there's only a you, you can only base an extension off what the player makes in the last year of his contract. So the Celtics can offer a 5% raise on or an 8% raise on the last year of his contract, but he signed a below market value contract where if he becomes a free agent and the Celtics have his bird rights because he's played here for more than three years, He's allowed to make, at maximum, without making an all-NBA team, 30% of the cap, whatever that number is, whatever that cap number is, 30% of it. And, and in two years, that, that could be that could be up to upwards of what? $180 million, $190, somewhere in that, there for the cap, $180 million. So 30% of that could be your starting point. And then you get 8% raises for five years after that. Just makes sense. It just makes sense. Why would he ever leave? I mean, my thought is that he probably would sign that deal and then go the demand a trade route if he really didn't want to be in Boston anymore. Because as a free agent, you can't sign that kind of contract. If he wanted to go home to Atlanta, let's just say, for example, hypothetical purely hypothetical situation. If he wants to go back to Atlanta and they can offer him four years at 5% raises and they, they can't, they can't offer him the same overall package as Boston. Now that's a big enough deal where maybe he does say, Hey, I want to leave and I want to go home. Maybe he just wants to go home. Maybe he just doesn't want to be in Boston. Maybe he wants to play in a certain city. Maybe he wants to play with a certain player. All 
all reasons for a guy to not want to stick around. Guys leave for their own reasons. Free agency is free agency. You're free. You are free to do whatever you need to do as a free agent. You're free to go. And that's that's a player's decision. Nothing you can do about it. So, yes, to Joe's point, security, more money, a major role, one of the lead roles, one of two lead roles on a contender. Who knows, in two years, maybe maybe he will have already gotten himself a ring. So, who knows? Maybe there's something... Maybe there's something there that makes him just say, I'm going to stay. However, personal preference. You don't know. No, nothing's guaranteed. He will go into free agency. Lucas says, whenever Jalen is in a trade rumor, it seems like there's, it seems to be so much reporting and speculation of whether this might make him feel disrespected or want to leave. I don't see this happening as much with other players. Um, why so much drama? Well, I don't think I don't think there's that same. First of all, well, let me just quickly say there. I think people there is a phenomenon with people that uh, if like you see something happening in Boston because you live and you consume this and you you see a lot of it. And you don't hear it for the examples he uses, Bam out of bio, Denver, uh, Devin Booker, uh, Pascal Siakam. If you don't live in Phoenix, you don't consume Phoenix media, you don't listen to Phoenix podcasts. You don't know. You really I think I think the discourse around players who are in trade rumors or in repeated trade rumors, I think that's this is just a general consensus of how people think players feel in those trade rumors. So I think a, there's a phenomenon here where because you consume only Boston stuff, you hear all of it. You don't consume Phoenix stuff. You hear some of it. You don't consume Toronto stuff. You hear some of it. Same thing with Miami. And in that, some of the stuff that you hear, you don't hear the same things you hear in Boston and you raise the stuff that you don't consume up to this kind of false equivalency to what you hear in Boston because you hear everything in Boston. But the stuff that you're missing could be the stuff that you're hearing in Boston, right? The stuff you're missing in Phoenix could be the stuff that that gets said in Boston. The, that So I would just hesitate. And it's not just this where Lucas, you know, what Lucas is saying, people in general do this. We do this all the time. Oh, they say this about this, but I don't ever hear anybody talk about this. Well, you know, are you consuming enough to to have that other side be represented or not? Like what's what's your deal there? So, I don't think I don't think that there's added drama around Jalen Brown. I mean, maybe there's some because there's more media and it's a little more intense in Boston. Maybe there's more than Phoenix or Toronto, but it's there. It's there for everybody. Being in a trade room is dramatic. So that's going to happen. So that those are the thoughts on Jalen. He, he is going to enter free agency. He has a ton of incentive to stay. They can't offer him any more than his extension until he becomes a free agent, and then they can offer him the max, whatever that is. And then... The rumors are rumors. I think that I really do think Jalen's mature enough to get past these rumors. I really, I don't think that he's caught up in any drama, but yeah, I know the SMH tweet. I think, I think that's just like a, Oh God, here we go again type of thing. And I, I do think that that drama exists in other cities. You just don't hear about it. All right. Up next people talking about backup bigs taco fall question How about that. We'll talk about that after we talk about Bet Online. BetOnline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your betting needs. Find all your favorite sports and events at the number one source for odds, lines, and games. Find reviews and news of every league 
including the NBA, Major League Baseball, NFL, which just get got started with its Hall of Fame game, NHL, combat sports, esports, golf, it's all there at Bet Online, which continues to be the top online resource for all your sports wagering information. From live in-game betting scores and podcasts, they have you covered. Head to Bet Online today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action happening today. Bet Online is where the game starts. Please gamble responsibly. Thanks for making Locked On Celtics your first listen every day. How about making Locked On NBA your second listen? I host on Wednesdays with Jake Madison of Locked On Pelicans. We always have a good time. It's rotating hosts all week long. That show is still Monday through Friday, so make sure you're subscribed there. Find it wherever you got Locked On Celtics. You can even watch the show on YouTube. Join us. Join me on Wednesdays. Get my takes on the NBA as a whole. Getting back to the mailbag here, Todd says... Not sure Brad enjoyed being part of a Taco Fall sideshow, but signing Taco to a partially guaranteed contract to lean on and foul and bead for eight minutes a game, wear him down in the regular season, isn't the worst idea until a minimum buyout big man emerges for seeding in playoff games. What do you think? I uh, Look, I'm as uh, big a Taco Fall guy as anyone. I, I, I won't say I got to know him, but a little bit, just a little bit, just being around him for that year. He seems like a really nice guy. He seems really cool. Um, love having him around. That's just one big, massive setup, right? You can hear, you can hear what's coming next. But uh, no, I don't think I don't think Taco is the right guy. If you have Taco Fall guarding Joel Embiid, you're in trouble. If you have Taco Fall as your guy. For the MB, for Embiid, even even in one regular season game, he's he's just not that good. He's not. Taco is learning, and it's a long process for him to learn. I don't think he's at the NBA level. Uh, he is a uniquely constructed player, and he he has some NBA value based on his height, but he's, he's still, I think we saw him struggle. We saw him struggle a little bit in the summer league. Uh, I, I, I don't just don't see taco as the answer here uh, for the backup big, not even, not even as a partially guaranteed guy. I, I just don't think that's somebody you want to lean on at all. Sorry, rich. Says, looks like Houston and OKC need to waive some players. Who do you think would fit best? Mike Muscala, Derek Favors, or Boban as the Celtics' third big? Well, I think Derek Favors is more like Derek falling out of favor. <laughs> right? Huh? 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 No, that was terrible. Uh, yeah, I think I, I, I don't think that that Favors. I mean, none of these guys are good, but we're just talking about Noah Vonley and Bruno Caboclo. So it's not like those guys are any any better. Mike Mascala, I mean, he's he's taller. Uh, he's he's okay. Um, oh, but they just re-signed him, so never mind. He's uh, I I even missed this. They uh, as I'm recording this. Uh, on Thursday, they just re-signed Mike Muscala. So that's that's out anyway. Boban is interesting because he's had, unlike unlike Taco, he's had some NBA success. He moves better. He, I think he could, could be somewhat impactful. Uh, he's He's more than just the size. He does move better, and he does. He is a better basketball player. So, of those three, sure, Boban, why not? But uh, I think the Celtics are going going to go a different direction because Boban's not exactly switchable. I I would I would love I would just love for okay. Let me just say, personally, I would love to just have Boban on the team. I would just love to have Boban around. I would be requesting one on ones with Boban. Every day, he, I put him on the podcast, put him in my columns, put him in everything. He's He would be awesome, amazing. Uh, I would talk to him all the time. So selfishly, I would want him here for that. Uh, otherwise, I think I think they're, 
they're probably better off going in a different direction than any of those three guys. So we'll leave, we'll leave that there. We'll come back. We'll talk about playing with pace. We'll talk about nineties basketball and why I don't, I don't like nineties basketball all that much. And the college versus the pros question. That's going to be a really interesting. I, I love that question. I also love built bars. So if you're missing out on built bars, then you're really missing out, especially if you're missing out on the built bar puffs. If you haven't tried those, that's really something that's puffed marshmallow with a chocolate covering. And now they have cookie dough chunk puffs. They're covered in chocolate. They're cookie dough, uh, real cookie dough chunks in the marshmallow. Uh, this is my absolute weakness. I cannot stress this enough. Cookie dough, I, I don't really have a sweet tooth, but cookie dough, anything, you got me. The best part, though, is cookie dough chunk puffs are only 160 calories, and they have 15 grams of protein. So I could take this with me uh, going to the gym, which getting back on the horse, getting back into the gym, these cookie dough chunk puffs are a nice little reward for me getting back into the gym, plus my 15 grams of protein there help me as I'm lifting to get that protein in my body, help build some of that muscle. Go to built.com, snack a box for you, for the family. It's a treat, uh, meal replacement. Uh, like I said, protein, however you want it. Go to built.com, use that lock, promo code LOCK15. You're going to get 15% off your next order. It works every time. So no pressure. Get one box of cookie dough chunk puffs and I feel like you're going to like it. Then go back and stock up. If you don't like it for some reason, maybe you're, it's just not your thing. Try a different one. Try a mixed box. Try whatever you want. Use that promo code LOCK15. It works every single time to get 15% off every single order at Built.com. All right, let's finish off this mailbag here. Bill says, Celtics would be so much better offensively with pace why don't they have point guards catch inbound passes after an opponent's make above the free throw line, moving at least laterally, if not up court? Frustrating to see Smart at all catch the, catch it below the free throw line. Um, basically, more transition pace would make Jalen Brown, Derek White more effective, reduce Tatum's burden. I think we've seen... Marcus Smart, especially during the course of last season, plenty of times looking for the ball, pushing the pace. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Look, sometimes, maybe maybe sometimes guys are tired. They slow it down. They want to do something a little, you know, they want to set things up. They want to make sure they want to make sure they're getting a certain thing. So maybe, maybe that's part of it sometimes. But I do agree that even after makes is a very Tommy Heinsohn type of question and answer. Just because the ball has gone through the hoop doesn't mean you have to just sit there and walk it up. Get a lot of times after a team makes a basket, that's the time to actually run because anybody who's played and makes a basket knows what's happening. You take the shot, you see it go through, you go, yeah. And then you go running back, jog, jog, jog. The jog back after a make is the best part of the game. Go out there, make a jump shot. That jog back, you're like, yep. Feeling good about yourself for about a second and a half before you get back, you set your defense. All right, let's go. I just made a bucket. What do you got? That, honestly, that was my favorite part of the game. There's no better feeling than making, making the bucket and doing the slow jog back. And there's no worse feeling then making the bucket, doing the slow jog back, and all of a sudden see the ball whiz by your face and go, oh, crap, they're running off the make. So I say, yeah, Bill, I'm with you. Let's get these guys moving and, and running off these makes. Get yourself an extra possession or two or three or four or five per game. Do it. Push the ball because you shave four seconds here, five seconds there, five seconds there. You get yourself a couple of extra shot clocks over the course of the game, and that more opportunities to score means more bites at the apple, which means more, just more chances to put a bucket up on the board and win this game. So 
Use your depth. Use it. Run. I'm all for it. Very Tommy. Run. Run, Walter. Run. Connor says, I heard you on Lockdown NBA say basketball started to get worse in the 90s. I was born in 96, so I wasn't able to watch. Can you elaborate on why you think that? Well, Connor, first of all, I just resent your youth and just want to let you know that uh, I hate you for being that much younger than me. Just, just want to put that out there. No. <laughs> Uh, the nineties, I think some of it was the rules. Uh, the game got slow. The game, the, the scoring went way, way down. I think two thousands basketball was a reaction. Like the hand checking rules had to change. Uh, it was a very, the game kind of got really physical in the 90s like really really physical which is fine for me like i i love playing physical basketball i'll go out there and just you know pound on somebody all day long like i always loved playing a physical style of basketball contact never bothered me but aesthetically those games like i said on lockdown nba i always used to say my go to joke was if when i die and go to hell my 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 room in hell my room in the bad place will just be constantly watching uh, you know flipping the tv on and it's going to be like marv albert's voice saying once again from the garden the final score is 82 80 the knicks beat the heat like oh god no no i don't know but the defense was so good the physicality was so high and the style of basketball was just slower. The rules allowed it to be slower. And it just provided, it just made for a, a very unappealing product to me. I didn't like the product. And I don't know. I mean, 80s basketball, the defense wasn't exactly, I, I think the defense was better. Maybe I'm just romanticizing it in my head. But defense was better than people give it give them credit for. But also in the 90s, the defense really, really got crazy. And teams were regularly not scoring, not even getting to like the it was it was a 90s uh the the best scoring offenses were scoring 90 something points, maybe getting to a hundred. Um, too much of that, too much, too much uh, of like I said, those games in the 90s. 90-something to 80-something was all too common a score in the 90s. And who wants to see that? Who wants to see that on a regular basis, 82 games plus the playoffs, 100 games of 92 to 88? You know, maybe, and maybe the 130 to 128 is too far the other way, but at least that part, it's... I think that keeps I keep that keeps more people I think interested. But that's why I thought 90s basketball was just I, I didn't like I didn't like watching it. I need more balance. I love good defense, but I need more balance. I need some I need some level of scoring. And then finally Matt says if you took the best college team ever and the worst NBA team ever do you think the college team would have a chance to win a best of seven series? The short answer is no. The longer answer is hell no. And I don't know what would qualify. I, I don't, I don't know it well enough to say which college team is the best ever, but even the best college team. And you know what? While I'm here, since we're here, I'm going to Google best college basketball team ever. See what the consensus comes up with. Uh, okay. Bleacher Report has the number one. I'll just go with whatever they say. The 1963 through 75 UCLA Bruins. Okay. That run, John Wooden, totally get it. 
Uh, but even even that team, they had Lou Alcindor. They how many how many NBA players did they have on those teams? Three, four, five. Let's go to number two, the Duke Blue Devils. And these are overall franchises. So um, the best, the best uh, Duke team, let's see, you, you have Christian Leitner, uh, Grant Hill, uh, Bobby Hurley. Well, Grant Hill, I think, was an all-time great. Like, I think Grant Hill, if he doesn't get hurt, is in the conversation with Michael Jordan. He's that good. Christian Leitner is one of the best college basketball players of all time. And he flamed out in the NBA. Bobby Hurley, uh, he, he got into some sort of accident. So he uh, and his career got derailed because of that accident. We don't know how he would have been. But there were still how many, how many NBA players were on the best Duke teams? How many NBA players were on the best North Carolina teams? You think about that Jordan team with James Worthy and uh, was it Sam Perkins and a couple other guys, maybe, but none of none of these teams had a full roster of NBA players. Meanwhile, the worst NBA team has a full roster of NBA players, and even though they are the worst NBA players. They're still there. They're still in the NBA. And I just don't think people, and this isn't a comment on Matt. I think Matt Matt's asking a question. Uh, I think people in general don't understand how good you have to be to even be the worst NBA player. The worst NBA players are the best players you have ever seen in your life. If I took the worst NBA players and put them into your men's league, that player would score 100 points without without blinking, without breaking a sweat. Those players would be so dominant. You'd be like, oh, my God. How is this person not like Michael Jordan? This guy's Michael Jordan. I, I can't believe how, how good these people are. If I took a nameless, faceless guy and – who is the worst player in the NBA and said, here he is. Let me put him in college. He'd be really, really, really good. You know, and at that level, the worst of the players on the worst teams, the the Philly process teams, a uh, couple of these Oklahoma City teams, even those guys, they're it's it's this collection of actual NBA talent. So if you take those college guys, they're younger, they don't understand the NBA game, you take them at their 18, 19-year-old, do they have a chance in a seven-game series? Maybe, maybe they'll win. Maybe. And, and I'm, I hesitate to even say this because I think the consensus would be that, that that college team would get swept. And I'm, I'm willing to give uh, Jordan-worthy – Perkins, and I'm I'm sure I'm drawing a blank on on others. The benefit of the doubt, and say, you know, well, hey, maybe, maybe something goes wrong. Maybe the NBA team is shooting poorly, and these guys catch fire. And it is Jordan, and it is, you know, it is NBA like NBA greats, like great NBA players. Uh, eventually, maybe they catch catch some sort of fire, and and so be it. But I think the consensus would be that those guys would get swept. They would have no chance at all, at all, at all against even the worst NBA team. The worst NBA team will beat the best college team. Every year we get the whatever the number one team is, uh, especially if they're you know particularly dominant, and the worst team – they can Indiana beat Sacramento. Like, no, no, you can't. Can can the Wildcats, can Kentucky beat the, you know, the, the Oklahoma City Thunder? No, no, you can't. Never, never, ever, 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 ever. 
Never. Not going to happen. NBA players are better than college players, especially these college teams who only have three or four, at best, three or four NBA players, and then a full roster of guys that are not NBA level. And all you need to do is pick on one of them. You got All you got to do is pick on one. You've seen what one weak spot can do to a team. That's the other guys. You can say, well, you know, these guys might hold their own, but then you got to put in, you know, your seventh or eighth guy. And that's where it all falls apart. So not going to happen. I shouldn't have even, I shouldn't have even given them one game because it's always, I think it's always going to be a sweep, but just because of the odds, because you can't rule out everything I say is possible for one game, but it's, it's always going to be a sweep most likely. All right, that's the mailbag. We'll get to plenty more mailbag questions. This is a th- now Monday, Wednesday, Friday podcast, so we're going to do three days a week. So usually I do mailbag Monday. Obviously, Monday was a big remembrance for Bill Russell. Um, you can go listen to that. We talked about Bill on Monday, talked about him again with Tom Westerholm on Wednesday. So, uh, but Barring unforeseen circumstances, I'll do I could do another mailbag on Monday and get back onto the mailbag Monday rotation for the next few weeks until the regular se- or the preseason starts up again. It's coming soon, coming soon. And once it does, five days a week, back to five days a week. So make sure you are subscribed wherever you get your podcast. This show is free, fresh, three days a week for now, five days a week pretty soon, and it's on YouTube. So subscribe and share the podcast. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell everybody they should be listening to and watching the Locked On Celtics podcast right here on the Locked On Podcast Network.